in a three-part series brought to you by CloudSmith called DevOps Disruptors. I'm Glenn Weinstein. I'm the CEO here at CloudSmith. I'll be joined in a few moments by two very uh, esteemed experts in this topic, and we're going to have a great discussion. It's actually a three-part webinar series, as I mentioned, so you can register for the whole series. We'll be streaming the series uh, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, and on Dev.2. To register for the series, just head on over to cloudsmith.com, or also you can scan the QR code that's currently on your screen, and you can join us for all three sessions. Uh, but today will be the introductory session, and we're really going to lay the groundwork uh, for what platform engineering is and why we think it may be a disruptive trend um, to the topic we all know and love as DevOps. More specifically, the catalyst for this webinar series was a recently published report by the analyst firm Omdia entitled Market Disruptors Moving from Platform Engineering Does Not Mean the End of DevOps. And we're going to get into this report and we're going to debate some of the points that the authors have raised. Um, I would summarize that report, a couple of my key takeaways from Omdia's report were, first of all, that uh, DevOps uh, is necessary but not sufficient to meet the challenges of multimodal IT. And when teams today are choosing their own tools, uh, they're inhibiting they're inhibiting internal collaboration. Um, Omdia also argues that developers face more challenges today than when DevOps first emerged around 2009. Specifically, we're deploying to containers now. We're deploying to Kubernetes environments. We're pulling a lot more open source. Uh, software than we ever have, and we're expecting the developers to manage the security risks and synthesize an incredibly complex chain of tools just to build anything, to get anything done, and to actually write any code. Omtia, in this white paper, predicts that platform engineering is an emerging uh, organizational approach that aims to solve some of these challenges. So, on that note, I'd like to welcome in our panelists. So I'll start with uh, co-founder and chief strategy officer right here at CloudSmith, Alan Carson. Welcome, Alan. Thanks, Glenn. Great to be here. Yeah, great to have you. I also want to welcome to this webinar, Luca Galante, VP of Product and Growth at Humanitech. Hi, Luca. Hey, Glenn. Hey, Alan. Good to be here. Pleasure right. to have both of you. Uh, so uh, I think you're the right two panelists to kick off this webinar series and talk about what we're really seeing companies and large organizations do around how they've implemented DevOps principles in the last decade or so and what they may be thinking about in terms of uh, platform engineering or maybe a migration or an evolution of what we mean by DevOps or what we mean by platform engineering. So Luca, I'd like to start with you uh, from your perch as head of product and growth at Humanitech. Um, what is actually happening? What is literally happening? What are you seeing um, organizations that build and develop software starting to do? Are they really starting to build a department called platform engineering? Yes, correct. Um, they are, mm -hmm. and um, there's um, there's an increasing number of organizations that are going down the platform engineering route, especially in the enterprise, mid-size to large-size enterprises. They're really, I think, waking up to the fact that DevOps is a great idea in theory, but it there has some scaling issue, so to say. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and I think to understand that. You know, it's helpful to take a, a quick walk, maybe down down memory lane. Um, you know, DevOps was kind of a response to this idea of you know this this like bad practice of just throwing code over the fence, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you had some like poor sysadmin person down in the basement that was crazily enough, like actually buying the physical servers and do the networking. And then on top of that, I had to figure out, okay, how do I run this code that they're just throwing at me? Um, and so then um, like early 2000s, this idea of like, hey, if you build it, you should also be responsible for running it was kind of like really popularized in the industry. And I think it, from my perspective, it, it is interesting um, that, you know, if you look at virtually any, industry in the world since the 1800s when we had the kind of like the assembly line and Harry Ford and so on you know the trend has been towards specialization except for software engineering where at some point we thought it was a great idea that just like hey everybody does everything um <laughs> and uh yeah. 
All right. So you're saying that DevOps emerged to solve a problem, which is this throwing software over the fence, but it brought its own problems, which is it, it forced everybody to be a generalist. Yeah, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's kind of like a bad word to say separation of concerns, I think, um, today in the industry. Um, and, and I disagree with that. I'm a huge advocate for that. I do think that you need different teams to do different things and um, you need a you know, development team that builds features and products. You need a infrastructure and operations team that maintains the infrastructure that those products are, are deployed and running on. And then you need a platform team to actually build some sort of layer in between those two teams. Okay, so you're not uh, advocating for a return to the bad old days. Um, um, l let me actually ask that in a in more pointed kind of a way, Luca. Luca, like, is Deva are Deva is are the principles that led to the rise of DevOps still true today, um, or is that just an obsolete way of looking at the world? No, very much so. I think they're 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 still very alive, and to um, you know, to, to the point of the the report that you mentioned in the opening, I think. Um, platform engineering is not any type of sort of like DevOps scaler, is really an evolution of DevOps that actually enables true DevOps at scale in the cloud native era. Um, mm. Cloud native slash hybrid, whatever you want to call it. But the point is, mm. you know, this DevOps, you know, the, 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 the original idea of DevOps works if you're like a few tens of people, everybody's very familiar with your tool chain then it's fine. You can actually do real DevOps. The problem is if you have like hundreds or thousands of developers and you have a very complex tool chain, it's really not realistic to expect your latest hire, i.e. some, you know, junior front end to come in and be familiar with your tool chain end to end and, and be able to do things. Instead, they'll be blocked, they'll end up waiting and they'll end up basically creating a bottleneck of tickets for your for their for their ops colleagues or for other more senior developers that will end up doing this like shadow operations right and the first companies to realize this were sort of like the leading tech companies and advanced engineer organizations like the spotify's mm -hmm. the google's the airbnb's who basically looked at this and we're like, okay, I mean, DevOps sounds great in, in theory, but in practice, I'm onboarding like literally hundreds of developers a month to this like crazy, you know, complex setup that is increasingly complex. And I can't expect them to all be knowledgeable about everything. So I just need to build some sort of platform layer. And they were the first to do platform engineering that that's been sort of trickling down to smaller teams and less advanced organizations. That's interesting. So just the same way that some of the larger tech companies um, pioneered a lot of uh, technology that has grown into open source projects that we all have come to know and love and adopt. They've also pioneered this kind of organizational structural change, um, observing that DevOps kind of has some flaws or some some challenges at scale. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So Alan, um, you and uh, Lee Skillen, our other co-founder here at CloudSmith, you started the company um, really um, in the earlier days of the DevOps era. Who were the first customers that you sold CloudSmith to and were they DevOps teams or what did you see um, back, I guess, in the you know, mid 2010s? Yeah, well, uh, there, was a, there was a bit of a mixture. I think like ultimately, yeah. Um, when you think about it, DevOps is enablement, and you know, and removing the you know the the, the constraints that are are there to to really um, build out automation. And so, it did get a little bit, I suppose, perverted in terms of like how it um, was actually rolled out in terms of away from the the concepts. And so, what we started to see, and sort of in that time frame, was teams coming in, sort of small teams coming in, trying to sort of build out automation. And then larger enterprises, which were um, maybe trying to put the genie back in the box a little bit in terms of like that kind of let, you know, their development teams sort of build on technologies, whatever technologies they wanted. And so they were mm. sort of disparate, um, different languages and different CI, CD tools. And, um, I wanted to start kind of consolidating that together. And one of the earliest um, companies that we saw um, was MyOB in Australia, who, who came in and they had, um, I think, 50 developer teams. And okay. this and is a, had, a decent sized software company making financial, yeah. like a financial product. Yeah. 
um, mm -hmm. and and they had that problem, and but they had set up uh, a sort of DevOps operation, um, which, when you think about it, is really what we're talking about here in terms of of, of, um, uh, of platform engineering. But um, to kind of start pick the to picking the tools that would ultimately start to consolidate um, a lot of those processes um, into a, a sort of a streamlined um, view of what was happening within their organization. And again, from the sort of the, you know, the DevOps side of it, like, you know, observability was one of the sort of the key factors that um, uh, the, the sort of it, it, it promoted. And I mean, if you start to consolidate in terms of like the tools that you have, all your information is flowing into, um, you know, a finite set of tools, you start to get that observability um, coming mm -hmm. back out. All right, so you're starting to get into one of the two problems that both you and Luca have identified with the original DevOps principles, which are the, the inability to scale past a few tens of developers, I think you said, Luca. And then, Alan, you're describing this uh, kind of mess of different tools that have been selected, different CICD tools, different developer tools um, that lead to like a lack of integration or lack of observability. So it are, uh, first of all, are those the right problems uh, that we're talking about solving with platform engineering? Um. Yeah, uh, I think I think the from the ops perspective, yeah, having to maintain just like growing amount of tooling and and then also mm -hmm. at the same time while trying to balance the different preferences of different dev teams, right? So you have like dev team A that like wants to use Jenkins and then this other thing, and then te dev team B that wants to use like you know GitHub Actions and then this other thing and so on. Like that yeah. becomes like really unwieldy really quickly. But I think mm -hmm. like the the actual pain points in terms of what platform engineering is is aiming at, I would say are enabling developer self-service. So the, the lack of self-service, the fact that developers are just like waiting and kind of stuck and yeah. and they have to face this constant sort of like increase in cognitive load um, in handling all these things. And then the flip side of that, which is just this huge flow of ticket ops for ops teams that constantly need to like put off fires and become a, an organizational bottleneck. Um, and, mm -hmm. and what that also becomes is then a, you know, this like constant like manual configuration and ad hoc solutions and just like mm -hmm. a, a general lack of standardization and scalability. So those, I'd say those are the two sides of the coin that, that platform engineering tries to address. Okay, so you know, you you mentioned developer self service. You know, this I remember when AWS was first introduced. Not to age myself, but you know, this idea that you could just request a server and two minutes later you had a server um, instead of two weeks later. You know, that was the original notion of self service in the cloud. But you're taking it to a different level. You're basically saying, well, I should be able to self serve my tool, my tool set, um, my stack, my integration of those tools should be available through self service. So we're starting to describe, I think kind of what platform engineering is. Is platform engineering basically a product? Is it, an, is it the ability to offer a product to your internal customers, your internal developers? And if so, what's the product exactly? Yeah, um, correct. So, so I mean, platform engineering is, is really like a discipline, right? That you can think of as basically taking this like tech and tools that you have floating around, in the, especially in the enterprise, and effectively binding them together into golden paths that enable developer self-service right and then the, the sum of these golden paths is uh the the end product of the platform engineering initiative which is an internal developer platform or idp for short uh, which is really this like platform layer that to your point the platform team builds as a product right so like in the platform engineer community there's a, always a lot of conversation around platform as a product as one of the like core principles of platform engineering which I also think is what ultimately differentiates a you know SRE, cloud ops, DevOps, in, in you know meant in the traditional way from a platform engineer, um, because earlier you would you were really there to effectively add infrastructure, maintain the infrastructure, make sure that infrastructure was available and scalable and so on, and 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 effectively kind of like teach developers about the infrastructure, whereas the 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 um, um, 
and, and and again, we've gone into why that's not really scalable. Whereas the platform engineer job is to take that infrastructure and package it into a self-serviceable platform layer that uh, effectively abstracts all the complexity. So the developer doesn't really need to understand unless they want to. And then there's a whole conversation around kind of like golden path versus golden cages and how much you abstract versus how much context you provide. Uh, but that's yeah. a separate thing. I want to get into that actually, but let's let's stick with just for the moment the really the definition of what platform engineering is. You you made some great points here, Luke. You basically distinguish it from SRE or other types of um, kind of um, operational teams that uh, you're really describing a true uh, somewhat you know unique product that didn't exist ten years ago. Is there um, something unique uh, or did something change because the way we develop in the cloud? Uh, today, uh, provisioning cloud resources that just, I guess, increase the urgency for the need for something like platform engineering? Would platform have, engineering have emerged if we didn't have AWS and Azure and the Google Cloud Platform? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I, I, um, I think so, eventually. <laughs> um, but um, it, um, it certainly, there, there was certainly like an accelerated need for that. Because as we said, like, I think that the two the two vectors that really drove um, this, you know, this like leading tech companies to the realization like, hey, this is not working. Like one was the the just sheer size of the engineering org. Like, I mean, AWS itself, I think when they launched was like 300 engineers, right? So like com very small, like compared to like what we have today, right? So that, that literally like that organization literally 100x or so, right? Like, like two mm -hmm. orders of magnitude. Um, and, and at the same time, you had all the enterprises that, you know, 20 years ago, I don't think like McDonald's and Ford really had a ton of in-house developers. Maybe they had a few and like they were working. So now they all have their own engineering shops and they're pretty big, right? So that was one vector. But then the other vector, to your point, is, is just like, you know, look at the CNCF landscape, right? It's just like, it's crazy. Um, yeah, and, cl and cloud native can the cloud native right. computing framework exactly yeah. cloud native computing foundation um and right. it has you know i don't know like maybe thousands of different tools right to pick from and you have, mm -hmm. and you have all these like overlapping trends like containerization microservice architectures uh, kubernetes um iac infrastructure as code like all this like complexity layers that added on top of each other to make obviously people's life easier but when you combine all of them um it can be quite tricky to navigate yeah. you just hit on three things containerization kubernetes yeah. and infrastructure as code that um really you know those essentially i think didn't exist 15 years ago um each of those and have uh, just added to the complexity stack that modern developers face um, Alan, CloudSmith came in to the market as a cloud native tool itself. Um, did you, did you, do you think that, um, I guess, do you, do, you, do you see a similar evolution in the way that, that customers are adopting um, tool, tooling for larger um, software organizations, that there's this um, movement towards creating a product that self service that, that developers can self serve. I mean, did you see that? Did you see the opposite of that in the early days of CloudSmith? And do you see today CloudSmith customers kind of consuming um, tooling in a different way? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I agree with Luca. I mean, I think ultimately mm -hmm. there's just a huge, vast amount of choice, you know, of, mm -hmm. of tooling that's available, and that, you know, and I think if you let large development teams at that level of choice you're just going to get a different result every single time mm -hmm. so ultimately uh, you know building in guardrails into you know how you you know build your technology stack um is is sort of vital so that you get you know a, a coherent uh, ability to to write and deploy um your own software and so um you know as every company is a you know a software company um like luca mentioned like ultimately that becomes a, an important thing now in terms yeah. of like where CloudSmith sits in that stack like you know we have 30 different formats um and like the, you know typically it's about seven or eight different formats per large enterprise using it um mm -hmm. and no no two are the same for you know um, everybody just has built software in a in a slightly different way, and so it's really about trying to form fit the way that 
people want to approach the problem with the tooling that they they have and and ultimately that ends up being part of the the problem and the challenge and um and finding the right tools that fit into solving that um is is the sort of the key driver well you're raising a really interesting point now and you talked about 30 formats or maybe average organization eight forms but by formats we're talking about languages we're talking about the way that you build literally build your software and i think it's an important distinction to make i uh, i don't think we're saying that platform engineering means get everybody on python um it's uh, i assume we're kind of recognizing hey the world is heterogeneous it's probably going to stay that way different languages different strengths but it is talking about trying to get developers who are writing in different formats to at least use a common tool set is that a fair way to break it down luca yeah yeah absolutely and it's 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 um it's really about building i guess like um, you know, just like just paved roads, right, for developers. So like you can have mm. your different preferences and so on, but you need to consolidate and you need to standardize more than anything, right? It's really about driving standardization by design across your yeah. entire engineering setup. Um, and, and that, you know, you mentioned earlier, like this original idea of like, hey, you have the console, like I just self-serve things, right? But that that's also part of the thing, like when you want to, when you build an internal developer platform as an enterprise org, you wanna you wanna have a clear way for developers to do that, right? That is not right. um, that is not like hey, you're free to do anything. It's just like no, there's like this like clear golden path for you to follow. Because you know, I mean, we see really like platform engineering is is especially sought after in regulated industries. Like those are the ones that mm. immediately get the value because you not only have the ops teams looking at this and be like, oh, this is gonna make my life a lot easier. But you also have the security teams are looking at this and like, hey, I can actually enforce, you know, all sorts of like policies and governance things uh, automatically through the platform. That's a pretty wide swath of companies, actually. You talk about regulated or semi-regulated. So, okay, so you you mentioned you said paved roads. That's a great visual of what platform engineering is actually providing. Let, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, last I checked, developers don't always do what the corporate mandate says, or at least they don't willingly do it. Um, you've got to. Uh, you've got to provide a little bit more kind of like of an attraction to get developers to agree to do something different. Um, so what we've talked about in the first part of this pod, uh, podcast or webinar is great, but um, how do you actually get developers to adopt these standard platforms that platform engineering is putting out or these paved roads? Uh, isn't that part of the challenge? I mean, we're, by definition, we're talking about pretty large organizations, right? Hundreds of developers. How do you get all those teams to agree to this? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think it is it is actually the key question and the key challenge in the platform engineering space is how do you, you know, how do you roll out a successful platform engineering initiative? Because you need to convince all those different stakeholders, right? You have like application developers that you mentioned, but you also have the security teams that we said earlier. You have the existing infrastructure and operations team. You have architects. You have CCOE, like the Cloud Center of Excellence. You have the executives. It's crazy, right? And the problem is that I see a lot of platform engineer initiatives fail because they try to convince everybody at the same time. Like, you know, the everything, every all at once movie. It's like that, where it's like you, you need to come like person it's a, a pretty B, chaotic C, movie. It was, yeah. yeah it was I mean, it, lo it looks like that in the end, right? Because okay. you get to person Z and person, and it's been six months, right? And person A completely forgot about you. And, and it's like, it's so easy to lose the momentum which is why I think so much of our platform engineering is actually about frameworks and processes and like how do you drive this org transformation across the different stakeholder groups. And so to your point, you can start with the application developers if that's like the, the key stakeholder group that you want to focus on first. And there, I think it's really about, well, how do you provide something that's 10x better than the current mm -hmm. state? And I will say, Sounds like, well, that is better, but actually the current state is really bad <laughs> in most cases, right? It's like in enterprise organizations, you need to wait for like two or three weeks to get a database or an environment spun up for you, right? Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, to do something that's self-serviceable and where maybe restricts a little bit your, your you know, your, your way of ro roaming around, but it actually provides you something right away um, is, is much better. And also, I mean, I think it's 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 also about like again how do you roll that out across different teams where do you start 
um, you usually want to start with a pretty experienced team that is not afraid of you know testing out new things, but is also like quite familiar with your entire stack. Um, because if you can make them happy, usually you know the maybe less experienced teams will be very happy very quickly because they're the ones that want to deal even less with infrastructure and all these things, right? They just want to uh -huh. deploy a change or anything. Yeah. Right. Luca, okay. do, Luca, do you think like culturally things will change over the next, you know, five to ten years where the people that are happy in kind of having it all set up will gravitate towards large enterprises and those that want to want to pick their tools, you know, will will go to startups and, and small businesses? Yeah, I think it's super interesting because it is very much like a cultural I mean, I think there's a few trends, right? Like we spoke about this like trend of like the, um, you know, against specialization. Um, there's also, I think, a really interesting like um, um, sort of like job market point to be made that is, you know, you have in the last 20 years, there's been a huge shortage of developers. So developers really have been able to be the prima donnas of like, hey, I want to do ABC, whereas that, which hasn't happened in a lot of other industries. And, 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 and to your point, then you have the, the cultural layer on top. Like I, I see platforms, for instance, being developed and adopted in places like Brazil are different than in places like San Francisco, right? Because mm. culturally in Brazil, you have much more of a hierarchical culture. Um, and, and so platforms are just imposed and nobody even questions that. And it just makes their life better for everybody. Whereas in, um, in, and yeah, there is an element of like, oh, I'm, I'm a little bit more abstracted away and oh, like I need to find my developer engineer dignity somewhere else maybe. Um, but um, at the end of the day, like on, from a org perspective, it, it makes a lot more sense. Whereas you mm -hmm. definitely have this, this like uh, flatter hierarchical cultures um, where, where it's like, no, you know, don't, don't, don't take away my freedom of like messing around with Helm charts. You know, you're describing, uh, I don't want to overstate, but you're describing potentially a pretty profound advance, I think, in the art of software engineering. I think for 30 years, we as an industry have hoped to make software engineering an engineering discipline uh, where there's some guarantee of quality and there's some standards that professionals follow. And I think we all know software engineering is fallen really well short of those standards you know you would uh, you can't trust a piece of software like you can trust a bridge uh, not to collapse or a building not to fall down but maybe this is kind of like a step in the right direction of saying that there is a um th th it's okay actually to have standards um and uh, standard tool set um it doesn't restrict your creativity if anything i think you know um, artists true artisans will say that you know a, a constraints actually kind of advanced creativity. Do you, am I barking up the right tree here, guys, do you think? Is there something, is this an advance in the overall art of software engineering? I think so. I mean, I think, I mean, everything's an evolution in software. So, you know, like I think we're, we've been on the path um, and DevOps was, you know, at the beginning was, was very much a stake in the ground to basically say, hey, you know, methodologies need to be, need to be better. You know, you need to, um you know think about automation and how that builds in and i think this is sort of the natural evolution of, of where you're going to i think it makes mm -hmm. it maybe makes a bit more both economic sense for large organizations you know to i think i think they think in teams maybe you know and so like mm -hmm. to give a team a responsibility rather than to give the entire software organization a global responsibility i think it, it does ultimately mm -hmm. in some ways go back to the past but sort of take the good parts of the past and, and sort of bring them forward right okay so yeah, just, so let me oh sorry go ahead luca no no i was just gonna add that there like there's definitely this this i think like tragedy of the commons you know where like from an org perspective this makes a lot of sense but from the individual agent mm. perspective it's like why would i do this you know like mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. it's just like well you know i'm much better like building every for even like building in a, a entire platform from scratch instead of adopting things like cloudsmith and you might like you see like especially mm -hmm. because it's it's still so early platform engineering 
you see these people that are trying to like build the entire thing, right? Like you would never go yeah. and like build your Kubernetes from scratch, right? Like you're just like, you take, right? But because it's new, there you still have this tendency of like people that are like, well, I'm better off personally from my career perspective mm -hmm. to just do that. Or from, mm -hmm. the, from the app dev perspective, you know, I already have a platform. It's just called Bob. I just slack Bob and Bob does it for me. So like, why would I bother changing, right? And it's just like, well, yeah. because an org level, it's better, but then you need, and so that's the thing, the tricky thing about from engineering, which is really this like cultural transformation that needs to speak to each um, different stakeholder group and their mm -hmm. vested interests and make sure that you get everybody on board. But again, the point is don't try to get everybody on board at the same time. Just focus on one group first and then kind of expand from there. All right, let's talk about that a little bit, Luca. You, you, you've you kind of thrown out, um, uh, um, I don't know, I guess an extreme where um, pushing back seems silly, like I just want to have my own tools. Um, but wh where is a reasonable pushback? Like de developers don't want everything abstracted away, right? If you give them a completely turnkey set of tools where they, they're, they're too abstracted from what's actually happening under the hood, I don't like that either, right? So, wh what's the right comprom? What's the reasonable compromise? How abstract should a IDP be an internal developer platform? Yeah, I mean, I think if you play this asymptotically, like in 10, 15 years, you will have everything abstracted because it, it just makes right. sense. And I mean, that's the history of software engineering: just building abstraction on top of abstraction, right? So, like. You will get there eventually. I think the question again is culture, like who gets there first and why? Mm -hmm. And right, and, but but so to your point, like right now, you really need to just navigate and it, it highly depends on, on, you know, what your culture is in engineering org and what your developers need and what they want, what the trade-offs there are. Um, and and this, is, this is really the art of platform engineering, right? Because um, and, and and also why you know the only way to get an internal developer platform is to build one um and this is something that sometimes people are confused about because they're just like oh i can just buy my idp no like that's called the path for a platform as a service um mm -hmm. and you're effectively outsourcing this this compromise that you're talking about to an external product team that will have itself compromised between you and all their other customers Right. Mm. So that's, and that's the key difference to like when you're doing platform engineering, you're building an internal developer platform to fit the needs of your own organization. Now, again, I do think over time, this differences will flatten out. And I think even today, in most cases, you know, everybody thinks they're a special snowflake. When you really start digging into the details, <laughs> they're not like there, there's always the same three ways of configuring a Postgres. And there's all this oldest things that are like, very, very similar org to org, um, mm -hmm. but you really cannot tell them that yet. So it's just like we're in the in the middle of the transformation still, I think. That's okay. I'm not asking us to see 10, 15 years in the future. I think three to five years will more than suffice. Um, so, Alan, um, I want to uh, kind of come back to a couple of earlier points um, that we co that we covered. Like, do you agree or do you believe that uh, DevOps, you know, the, the underlying principles of DevOps, are necessary but not sufficient, or do you do you think um, uh, there's something wrong with DevOps? Basically, is there something inherently wrong with it? Um, no, I mean, I think the the concepts of DevOps were the correct thinking. It's re the removal of bottlenecks. It's, you know, the theory of constraints. It's, you know, there was there was a lot of good in there that was trying to like unblock, you know, organizations in the way that they were thinking and how that they were implementing things. I think yeah. given the fact that, you know, you have this explosion of, you know, cloud native tools, you have, you know, um, you know, huge cloud providers providing a huge amount of technology. Um, I, I think like it's hard to build a complete software stack with, you know, two people. It's, it's, it's very hard to do it with hundreds, you know, because mm. ultimately when you try to scale it, um, you know, and we've had this in CloudSmith, like we started with, you know, two or three people and sort of trying to build out, you know, a, a global distribution um, stack on AWS. You know, like there's there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of different technologies in there. And 
but like once you get it to a certain stage you have to start you know expanding and bringing more people in and you know you get to a point where you can have a massive team you, you get to a point where you don't want everybody having to do everything because everything right. gets sort of slowed down because everybody has to learn every individual piece and you want to kind well, of break that apart and, and give people right. um everything to support them and help them do the thing that you you need them to do well you're making the argument now for platform engineering but i want to come back to where i was taking heading with that question was like Basically, are there prerequisites to rolling out a platform engineering initiative? Because Luca, you hinted a few times on this in this webinar that um, hey, this pretty early days, right? Um, teams are at various points of their maturity, meaning there's a lot of uh, shops that are not particularly mature. Like, um, is there a prerequisite? Can every listener of this webinar should they all go and create platform engineering teams, or how do you know that your organization is ready? I mean, I'd say if you're um, if you're more than hundred, couple hundred developers, um, you know, you're you're probably just running into all these problems that we talked about, right? Um, mm -hmm. And the thing is, if you you know, I heard this line a while ago that was quite interesting because it it said like if you're if you're not, if, I don't remember, but if you're not building your platform, it's kind of it's building itself. It, it, it was better than this, but um, you okay. know, the, the point is. Right, that if you're not doing it consciously, you're not taking platform engineering, you know, as an initiative internally, you'll have somebody that somehow is building some sort of, you know, patchwork solution because that's what engineers do, right? Like they, they'll realize there is some sort of problem and they want to automate it and they want to standardize it. The problem is, again, that if you don't, if you just approach this from a technical perspective and not from a cultural perspective, you're, you're bound to fail. Um, slash you're bound to like have to scrap everything and start again from scratch, which is frankly, mm -hmm. interestingly, then one of the also main challenges of new platform engineering initiatives is that they're coming up against whatever legacy platform-ish thing has been built before. And they, you know, and then you have all these people that have, that are invested in it emotionally, economically. Sometimes they've already invested maybe like, you know, a lot of FTE time and, and some like actual like hard money into this. And so mm -hmm. they're pushing back. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's, that's I think the really one point. other interesting thing. Not a lot of green fields out there for hundred plus person mm -hmm. developer shops, but right. let me be more pointed about my question or I guess what I'm trying to get, which is, I guess everybody good at DevOps. Um, are there, are there, are there software organizations that aren't even doing the basics like, so like developers, uh, not a, not involved actually in deploying code or building code. I, I would presume that just like sort of like DevOps fundamental principles are a necessary prerequisite to platform engineering. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe uh, we uh, organization can kind of skip ahead and just go straight from like being primitive to going right to platform engineering. Does this make sense if you're not even like doing some basic DevOps principles? I guess. Um, I, I I'm trying to. I'm trying to articulate the answer there. I don't think it's as simple as that, right? Because like ultimately, like anybody who's building software or doing, you know, a hundred different tasks and, you know, and one of them is writing code and one of them is, you know, um, is broken down into various different things that they're doing in order to deploy that software. So like, you know, the methodology of DevOps ultimately leans into trying to, you know, build those functions out. I think, you know, even for small teams that are not hundreds of developer engineers, you know, it is sort of separation of concerns and it's not unlikely that you have a person or a team or people that are putting a bit more specialization into, you know, mm. some of the, you know, some of the tilling choices, maybe not all of them. Um, uh, you know, and ultimately how how you go about um, deploying that software. So, like, yeah. I, I don't think it's a binary one or zero. I think there's a big gray area that you can kind of build upon in there, and it it starts, you know, you know, from the cultural side of things of just trying to get everybody in the same page. So if you can get mm -hmm. fifteen people on the same page, um, you can you can do it with a hundred. 
Yeah, that is not easy. Hard to get two people on the same page. So I want to summarize what I think we are talking about or what we've said today or what we've agreed upon. Um, we've agreed, um, and feel free to jump in and correct me if you think I've got it wrong, um, that we've agreed that uh, DevOps was necessary but not sufficient. Uh, platform engineering is an evolution of some of those ideas, and it was brought on, or the need for that has been accelerated by the complexity of modern day, particularly modern day um, uh, hyperscale cloud uh, development um, and the trends uh, like containerization, Kubernetes, um, things like that, um, Terraform. And um, I think we've also basically said, listen, the, the core of what a platform engineering team does is it provides a, um, an, inter an internal developer platform, um, making some choices on behalf of developers so that everybody doesn't have to be a generalist in everything and we can go back to the natural course of human evolution, which is increasing specialization, which actually, generally speaking, accelerates productivity. Um, is that a kind of a good summary? What would you add to that, Luca? Hey, man, pretty good. <laughs> I just love the Henry Ford analogy. They're like, uh, we, all, we all thought that was a good thing, um, but we, except for in software, somehow we've managed yeah. to think we're different. Yeah. Alan, anything you'd add to that summary? No, I think that was pretty comprehensive. Um, mm -hmm. You know, ultimately, uh, you know, there's there's lots of places to start, and um, whether you're a big company or a small company, and uh, I, I think it's just making the decision to start trying to think about how you would consolidate and get everybody onto the same page. And Luca, what percentage of large software organizations, and let's define large as you know, 100 developers or so, or more, what percentage of them do you think have a team today that's either called platform engineering or is doing platform engineering? Yeah, hard to, hard to say. I would say probably like 20, 30%, something like that. Wow. Um, Gartner, really? Gartner predicts that by 2026, um, you'll have about... Uh, I think 80% of enterprise engineering organizations that will have some yeah. some some form of platform engineering initiative going, and I think that's that's uh, you know pretty much accurate. Um, I yeah, I, I'm I'm very curious to see how the the whole space will evolve. I can already see you know we've been hosting platform call now for three years, and you can already see the the level of the conversation maturing year over year. Is, is is really exponential like the mm -hmm, the, the mm -hmm. i think the space the industry is really hungry for standards for blueprints and for clear like how to's in terms of uh, frameworks and processes and and they're all those things are emerging and are happening so i do think it's moving really quickly and i'm hoping that it will not fall into the same trap as devops actually where it kind of ended up meaning a little bit of everything and a little bit of nothing and actually mm. staying on track to to be quite definite. Well, that's a dramatic. Uh, we're in the we're in the throes of a dramatic transformation of what you say is true. That we're going from twenty to thirty percent to seventy, eighty percent in a two year period. That uh, that means there will many many people in their sort of in their organizations are going to see uh, a pretty big reorganization taking place. It's a big prediction. Let's come back in two years and do this webinar again. Um, so, um, once again, Alan Carson, co-founder, chief strategy officer at CloudSmith, and Luca Galante, VP of product and growth at Humanitech. Thank you guys for your insights into platform engineering. That's been a very educational conversation for me. Um, another reminder, this was the first in a three-part webinar series. Uh, we're gonna go even deeper into some of the specifics around uh, platform engineering in the next two webinars. You can register for the whole series at cloudsmith.com or scan the QR code on your screen. We'll be streaming on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and dev.2. Um, uh, finally, I'm Glenn Weinstein. I'm the CEO here at Cloudsmith and a passionate software uh, developer tools guy. And uh, this is a super interesting topic. Thanks again, guys, for a really healthy conversation. Have a wonderful day. I'll see you in a week, August 7th, for the second webinar. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.